Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Training Systems, continuing our series on the scientific principles of strength training. Today we are covering principle number six, phase potentiation. So phase potentiation is really a fancy way for me to sound smarter than I really am by talking about using one phase of training to increase the potential of the subsequent phase of training. So the, the more official definition we're gonna give it is a logical sequence of training phases to promote the best overall long-term outcomes. And it's very important that at this point with phase potentiation, we're getting into more of the minutia, a lower priority, priority number six out of seven. So you could do a great job with, you know, to, to have a great training program, you have to do a great job of specificity, of overload. Of fatigue management, all right. But the thing that's going to set the you know the best, absolute, most optimal training programs apart from just good programs are these you know last couple principles. Phase potentiation being one of them, and I think something that's had a great deal of importance in my success and the athletes that I coach. The way that we're going to apply phase potentiation for powerlifting in its simplest terms are we're going to grow bigger muscles, build more muscle. That we're gonna, that's gonna happen in the hypertrophy phase. That we're gonna teach those bigger muscles to produce more force in general strength. And then we're gonna take those bigger, more force producing muscles and hone their technical prowess, hone the neural qualities of the one rep max in the peaking phase. There are three main considerations to be made when deciding how to, you know, figuring out how to properly phase potentiate a training program. Specificity, sequence, and adaptive decay. First, let's address specificity. Now you can go more in depth with the principle of specificity, which creates the framework for all training decisions in my video, all about specificity. But as it pertains to phase potentiation, as we look at spe specificity, we first need to look at directed adaptation, all right? And specificity as it pertains to phase potentiation is gonna essentially answer the questions, why is phase potentiation good? Why is it important? And the, the reason really is gonna be that training a single modality at once with all of your efforts focused towards developing that one quality is gonna be superior to, tr to trying to train multiple qualities during the same time. This, in my opinion, is what differentiates and distinguishes block style periodization or phasic structure periodization as being superior to a concurrent style of periodization or potentially even uh, what people traditionally would call you know, daily undulating periodization, though it's not necessarily inherent to that, but a common error that people are making is that they're, they're trying to train two, two varied of qualities within the same training week or within the same training month. So with looking at directed adaptation, that's telling us that if you want to get better at the squat, that you need to continually load heavier and heavier weights onto the squat week after week after week, session after session. And without doing that, with changing it too frequently, you're gonna fail uh, to satisfy that idea of directed adaptation. And you can go more in depth with that idea in uh, our previous video in this installment uh, on the principle of variation. So we need to have focus, directed adaptation, specific work directed at developing a quality session after session, week after week, for a minimum of three weeks to really see any adaptation occurring. After that, we need to look at training modality compatibility. Training modality compatibility is the idea that some training stimuluses pair together better than others. All right, and a, a very simple example of this is gonna be CrossFit. All right, so CrossFit is mixing together uh, different modalities from far ends of, of you know, the physical spectrum and trying to combine them into one, you know, into one training session, one training week, one training phase. And in doing so, they suboptimally develop any of those, those qualities. And that's not really gonna be a controversial thing to say. You'd have to be a pretty diehard CrossFit fanatic to say that trying to train all the things at once is gonna optimally develop any of them. So because you're watching this and you're probably a power lifter or maybe a weight lifter, all right, you're watching this with much more specific focused goals in mind. So we wanna choose training modalities that are very compatible, all right? And while things like muscle size and muscle strength, hypertrophy and general strength 
are much more compatible than, let's say, endurance and strength, they're still not going to be able to optimally, optimally, and again, we're splitting hairs, we're talking about maybe that last 1% of effectiveness, which in the short term, in, in, the, in the course of one training cycle, maybe is a negligible difference, possibly something you can't even really, you know, perceive. But training cycle after training cycle, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, potentially, of training, that little 1% difference in trying to, in, you know, that 1% improvement or 1% advantage in training for just muscular size and then just muscular strength and then just the peaking qualities is going to really start to manifest itself versus trying to train them all at the same time. So we need to make sure that in satisfying specificity, we are strategically choosing the modality that we're, we're aiming to develop. So we want to complement the training that we're doing rather than interfering with the development of any of the qualities. So that's going to move us on to sequence. For the training sequence, we need to decide which phase precedes another. And in doing so, we need to you know, make logical, strategic decisions to make sure that potentiation is occurring. So this is the principle of phase potentiation. Potentiation increasing the potential of the subsequent sequence. So we don't want to just randomly throw them together and say, well, Chad said we have to have phases to our training. All right, strategically organized phases. Improve muscle size, strength, then technique and neural qualities. So we want to be strategic and logical in the sequencing of our phases to make sure that this phase improves the potential of next phase and so on and so on. So let's use the analogy of a skyscraper and you can see my incredible artistic abilities here that the base of our skyscraper is going to be hypertrophy. It's going to be muscular size. The bigger that you can make that base, the taller you will be able to build the skyscraper. It is important to consider that in the actual building of a skyscraper, the first thing they do is dig a foundation, all right? It is actually going down, all right? So in properly phase, uh, phase potentiated training for powerlifting, you may have a decrease in the one rep max, all right, to be able to lay a better foundation of hypertrophy. That's fine. You don't need to be ready to lift the heaviest weights all the time because your competitions aren't coming up as a surprise, all right? You know when you're, when you're going to compete. So you can take that step back, you know, Pot uh, potentially in the short term, particularly for more advanced lifters, decrease the one rep max while you train for qualities of hypertrophy. Because while in the long run, doing sets of 8, 10, 12 reps, setting 8, 10, 12 rep maxes is going to help you build more muscle, in the short term, it is going to detract from the neural qualities and potentially a little bit the technical qualities, especially depending on what you do from an exercise selection standpoint. But in the long term, it's going to allow you to build more muscle, which is going to be greater, increasing the potential of the subsequent phases. So we're going to dig the foundation and lay a big base, build as much muscle as possible with hypertrophy. Then on top of that, you're going to build your main floors. All right. That's going to be the general strength. You're going to build that as tall as you can, as big as the hypertrophy you created will allow for. You could run into the issue of adaptive resistance there. So you cannot, you know, you made the, your base as wide as you did. You can't infinitely build on top of that and just keep doing strength, 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 and expect it to continually go up. Adaptive resistance is going to stop that. The longer you continue to do something, the longer you do the same thing, you're going to get some diminishing returns or slower gains with that. Again, refer to my video on principle of variation to learn more about that idea. So once you've exhausted, you know, you, you've pushed that to the limit of, of, of its adaptive resistance. You've built all the strength that you can. Finally, we're going to throw a little antenna on top of our skyscraper, and that is peaking. All right? That is the final piece of the puzzle. For an antenna to work well in the context of an actual skyscraper, it needs to be put up as high as possible. So the bigger hypertrophy base and the greater general strength main floors that you build, the higher that that peak is going to be able to go. If you were to put them out of order and the peak was down here, all right, you tried to put the general strength on top of that or the base on top of the antenna, the antenna can't support that. All right? And even if it could, it wouldn't be at the peak of the building, allowing it to perform optimally. With that being said, that is why you cannot try and peak all the time. You can't put the an an antenna at the base. You can't always be doing singles, training low volume. 
because you're not going to get the benefits of that big base of that general strength and putting the peak at the highest point of our training skyscraper. Finally, we move on to adaptive decay. The third principle that's going to make up this idea of phase potentiation. Adaptive decay means that we need, we need phases and we can't train everything at once. We've established that with the ideas of specificity and sequence. And the phases can't be random. They need to build on each other logically because all of these physical qualities have, you know, a time that they will last. That's a very common criticism that, you know, conjugate and concurrent coaches will make of a more linear style programming, saying that you're always moving away from the qualities that you previously developed. And that could be true if you're doing it wrong, all right? But as we move from hypertrophy to general strength, general strength will almost infinitely retain hypertrophy. So general strength in terms of doing sets of three to six reps, there's gonna be sufficient volume in there to retain the hypertrophic gains you made in the first phase. Now, you're not gonna build more muscle by doing that. You're not gonna build more muscle doing strength training than you would have with hypertrophy training, but you're not gonna lose that muscle either. So that's very important to understand. If you're doing sufficient volume during general strength, you're not gonna lose, you're not gonna have adaptive decay from the hypertrophy training that you were already doing. So it's this idea of like, if you don't use it, you lose it. That can become true if you're using inappropriate phase lengths. So peaking training is where it's really gonna become an issue. When you get down to doing those sets of one, two, maybe three reps, 90% plus work, which is very neurologically taxing, which is gonna have longer SRA curves, and you can refer to the principle of SRA video to learn more about that. So if you have an excessively long peaking phase, then you could run into an, uh, an issue of starting to lose muscle size, starting to lose hypertrophy, because peaking training cannot, should not, be sufficient, you know, uh, have sufficient volume to retain hypertrophy. So if you make that phase too long, you could run into an issue of losing muscle as you go into a meet, and that's certainly something you don't want to do. So how long should these phases be? Hypertrophy training, and this is of course going to all be based on competition calendar, based on the needs of the individual lifter. If someone has maximized their body weight in their weight class, they may have a shorter uh, hypertrophy. As you become more advanced, probably less hypertrophy is needed compared to beginner lifters. But, and these are pretty big ranges you'll see, but hypertrophy training is gonna last a minimum of three weeks, because that's the shortest amount of time we're gonna, we're gonna need to train uh, to satisfy directed adaptation and see gains in a specific area that we're working on or an exercise. Three to six months of hypertrophy. The higher end of that, five, six months, I would only suggest the training being that long, a phase being that long, if you're really good at getting bored, all right? And this is a, a more psychological issue because you won't run into as much of an issue of adaptive resistance, but you may just feel stale in what you're doing. So three to six months, probably more tending to a three or four month cap, but could potentially go as long as six months if you're great at being bored, but that could potentially yield a better result for you. General strength from, again, three weeks to six months. Same idea. The longer end of that, you could run into some adaptive resistance, you could run into some psychological staleness, but you could go as long as uh, up to six months. Again, minimum of three weeks. Finally, peaking, three weeks to three months. Now, how long should your peaking phase be? How should you make sure that you avoid adaptive decay of your hypertrophy? The more advanced you are, the more muscle you have, the longer you've been training, possibly the uh, use of Soviet sports supplements, will allow you to tend to the, to the higher side of peaking, three months, all right? There's very, very few people that come to mind who use a three-month peaking phase. I use a two-month peaking phase myself, six foot one, 370 pounds, been training for a long time, a lot of muscle mass. The shorter side of that, more beginner lifters, lighter weight class lifters, female lifters can and should use a shorter peaking phase because the weights aren't as heavy, all right, so it doesn't take as long to build up to, and they have less muscle and less testosterone, in the female's case, to retain that fitness. And less testosterone is gonna lead to a quicker adaptive decay of those hypertrophic qualities. So that is phase potentiation. That's how I set up my training. Hypertrophy, general strength, peaking. Phase lengths are gonna vary depending on competition calendar, depending on lifters' abilities, depending on where they are in their career. 
but it's very important to have the phases because you cannot optimally develop hypertrophy, general strength, or peaking qualities when you're trying to do it all at the same time. So make sure you go back, watch all the other videos, watch the whole series. Specificity, overload, fatigue management, SRA, variation, and now the principle of phase potentiation. Next, we'll have the final thing, individual differences coming up. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about this, check out Scientific Principles of Strength Training by Dr. Mike Isertel, Dr. James Hoffman, and myself on the cover for The Sex Appeal, as well as my book, A Thoughtful Pursuit of Strength, to go more in depth on how I practically apply this to my and my athletes' training. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the channel.